So uh, today we're talking with uh, Mo Kwame, Dr. Mo Kwame, who is the president of uh, the uh, San Jose State University. And uh, Mo, could you talk with us a little bit about your, your background, uh, what you bring to the presidency of the university? Well, thanks, Michael, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my background started with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Then I worked in uh, uh, construction and maintenance for a number of years overseas, then came to the uh, higher education after I started doing my graduate uh, work uh, in engineering. Uh, I actually started in the physical plant department, uh, working from maintenance to energy projects, and then worked my way up to associate vice president, to then to vice president and chief financial officer, and then to uh, the president. Of course, throughout this process, I was continuing my research activities uh, in the area of energy and environment, and then continued on to higher education. And uh, that basically has been my background of uh, been in higher education uh, for the last uh, uh, 37 years, basically. Mm. Well, it's an interesting, uh, interesting background. And over the years, I've enjoyed our, uh, our conversations. Um, I'd like to, for us to start the conversation in perhaps a little bit different place. Uh, for the last several years, you've been writing with your colleagues about the access to higher education uh, and in particular preparing students for success or structuring higher ed for uh, successful outcomes. So could you share with us your observations about that, uh, that topic? And then we'll move perhaps to some of the online uh, options as they may arise. Well, I think access to higher education is uh, becoming more and more important today because uh, we have uh, practically such a large number of our jobs uh, to require at least a bachelor's degree, a four-year college degree, basically. In addition to that one, practically most of our uh, professions require some level of uh, uh, technology. So for uh, a key for success for many of our students, regardless of major, is going to be being techno savvy. Uh, you know, right now, out of five out of every eight jobs, and uh, I believe uh, similar percentage of uh, new jobs that are create or higher uh, income jobs are in uh, uh, require some level of uh, techno savvy and uh, te technological competency. So uh, that's that's one aspect. I think the other aspect is that. As we, uh, as the, with the diversity of our country, we're seeing a larger number of uh, students from underserved communities, first generation college students, uh, first generation you know, from working families. More and more of them are coming uh, to colleges and universities. Uh, many who uh, might be the, uh, you know, in many cases, they are the first ones in their family to go to a college. So we're getting a totally different set of uh, students. And then, as I said, uh, the changing environment of the type of jobs that we have, because many of the technologies that we see are really stripping away money for in the employability of many of our individuals, which means that for many of the jobs that uh, existed in the last 10 to 15 years, many of them are being automated. So the level of uh, uh, entrepreneurship, the level of creativity, the level of uh, Techno savvy is becoming even far more important for our current college students uh, uh, to be uh, uh, to be successful and be part of the workforce and uh, thrive in that environment. In in some of what you've uh, written, you've addressed the question of preparation for college and success in that first year or two. And it occurs to me that that is uh, uh, perhaps related to or similar to the current thinking about increasing enrollment or making uh, community college more um, accessible uh, in in a variety of ways. Uh, how how are you how are you thinking about that, particularly within the context of uh, of San Jose State? 
Well, I think first of all, uh, you know, the, the last uh, two or three decades, there has been a lot of emphasis on access, uh, but uh, we have not put as much emphasis on success. So uh, the idea was to get students into college, but unfortunately, the retention uh, of uh, those students, specifically for the first and second year, was not as high as we hoped for. And uh, that's uh, in most public universities, on the average, uh, less than 50% or roughly about 50% of the students were getting a degree in six years. So we need to change that one. And as you put it uh, very rightfully, that most of the issues are in the first uh, two years of college, specifically for many of these students who do not have a background. Uh, the first and foremost problem is uh, lack of adequate preparation. And most of this preparation is uh, concentrated, or lack of preparation is concentrated in the area of math and English. You know, right now, if you look at it nationally, uh, somewhere between 55 to 60% of students who, are, uh, who enter college uh, need some form of math remediation or English remediation or both. And I remember I was just looking at the data for 2011, out of the 3.2 million students who entered college as a freshman, about 1.7 million of them just needed math and a similar number in English. And of course, some of them are the same individuals, but this not only increases the amount of time for them to graduate, but also this becomes one of the factors as to why uh, as the retention of first year retention is low among many of these students. <laughs> it's a it's a difficult challenge to be sure combine that with uh, rising costs and and this is a this is a dramatic set of set of issues um, to to what extent um, is the cost of attendance uh, an issue that you consider in your from your perspective I think the cost of attendance has become an issue for two reasons. Uh, one is uh, because uh, when you look at it for, you know, in the last uh, 25, uh, about 30 years or so, you know, from the 1980s, we see a drop of uh, support by states. Uh, and and uh, practically, except for maybe one or two small exceptions, uh, the state support in every one of our you know, contiguous uh, uh, states, we have seen a drop. And as a result of that one, the expectation has been uh, the families of the students to pick that cost. So that's why we've seen a dramatic increase in the tuition. That has been one. And the other aspect has been the scope and role of uh, universities, uh, where we've had a you know, complex uh, way of looking at costs. And in reality, uh, there's a lot of cross-subsidy where we see uh, that graduate students are being subsidized by undergraduates, upper division by uh, lower division. And, uh, and when you look at, and, and also maybe some of our science and uh, engineering students being subsidized by social sciences and humanities. So the whole idea of what it costs to, uh, to educate a student for a particular course across the institution, that, that, that number is quite blurry. And secondly, we have not had any kind of a serious effort in reducing uh, the cost of attendance for students. And then lastly, I think uh, the cost of textbooks and all of the other material has uh, skyrocketed in the last two decades. And for most students, the cost of textbooks on a year is becoming, uh, you know, quite, um, quite high. I mean, on the average for specifically science and math, we're talking about at uh, twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars a year, which is quite high for most students. Yeah, I, th I think it's remarkable. In the in the courses that I use, I try to use fair use materials um, in a in a very careful and copyright appropriate way. But uh, it's a, it's a difficult challenge for the students and for instructors as well to be able to provide the quality of materials that they that they need. Um, one of the things that some have touted to reduce cost is moving towards more digital forms in a whole variety of ways. And I know uh, or believe that your institution has experimented in, 
in a variety of, of forms within the public setting. Could you talk with us about those uh, experiences? Well, I think it's, uh, it comes in a number of different formats. Uh, first, as we just talked about the remediation, if there are ways that we can have that remediation be done while the students are still in high school, or if that could be done in a community college just uh, in that summer before getting to college, that will be the first element. Second, the right type of advisement for students is a big issue that many students do not get adequate advisement. And third, uh, for many who cannot really decide on the majors that they want to study or uh, when, specifically when we talk about students moving from one institution to the other, that articulation among institutions becomes an issue, specifically when those who go to community colleges and then follow up with uh, four-year institutions that in many cases, they end up taking some courses which uh, they refer to as uh, empty credits. For instance, in California on the average, you know, the uh, four-year graduation requirement is about 120 credits for most majors, but uh, on the average, uh, students go to, who go to community college and then to a four-year institution, they take about 154 units, so roughly a year extra. And then the other part uh, is uh, how can we really uh, try to provide uh, a, a more meaningful uh, learning experience for students. I think we have to recognize that the traditional lecture model that many of us were used to is not adequate and as, is not as uh, effective for current students. And how can we really change that passive learning uh, experience to a more active environment? And that's where I think uh, some of the technologies could potentially help where students could uh, you know, look at some of the material uh, through video um, uh, clips, other form of material before coming to the class. So the class experience really becomes uh, more active where they can work in teams, solve problems, and the professor acts more as a, as a coach and a consultant rather than just, uh, uh, you know, in a monotonic, you know, give them a monotonic lecture for the 15 minutes or 90 minutes. I think these are ways that students could uh, uh, could engage more because the engagement is really uh, part of what we really need to concentrate our efforts on. Hmm. The um, experiments with uh, online education at this point uh, sometimes are seen as being, by some observers at least, are being seen as failures. Um, by others, uh, they're perhaps an early evolutionary stage in the development of these technologies. What's, what's your view? Well, my view is that uh, we should, uh, when we look at technologies, we should not look at them as silver bullets or something that solves our, our problem, but also we should look at them as a tool. And if whenever a tool is used appropriately, and understand its capability, and even more importantly, its limitations. We can really benefit more from it. You know, for instance, at San Jose State, uh, we have been using. Uh, you know, we were the first university that started working with MIT edX using their first uh, uh, circuit class, uh, where students uh, watch the lecture before coming to the class. The class is basically uh, an activity, and uh, in that course, traditionally, the in the uh, lecture mode, the passing rate of students were about uh, 59%, which meant that about 41% of the students were taking the course for the second time. Using the new approach, we were able to change the, uh, the success rate of students from 59% to about 91%. So only 9% of the students needed to repeat that. So this is a savings in a number of different ways. Savings in the sense that more students uh, uh, would, uh, would uh, you know, would pass the course for the first time, and very few would repeat it. And uh, we did not have to offer uh, more repeat section for students, so it was a saving for students as well as the, as well as the university. But more importantly, I think uh, those were usually the courses that, because of the failures, uh, it will impact students' retention. That was one experiment that has been quite successful, and we have been following that one for the last uh, uh, basically three years, uh, and every time we've uh, brought more refinements. Uh, the other one was an experiment that we did over two years ago with uh, 
Udacity, and the idea was to offer courses uh, uh, for the first year and some of the remediation courses on a purely online basis with no uh, with no in-class sessions. Uh, our thought was how we can really reduce the cost of instruction. We were offering these courses for $150 for three credit course uh, with uh, providing 24 seven uh, mentorship for the students. Uh, in the first semester, first time when we offered these courses, our success rate was not very good. Actually, we it was below face to face, but by the second time out of the five courses in three of the courses, our success rate of the students were better than face to face actually. Uh, however, uh, because uh, Udacity uh, was interest moved on and uh, we, uh, and also at the university, and since the Udacity was not interested in following up, we abandoned that particular experiment. But I still believe that uh, utilizing online education with a combination of different efforts, whether it's uh, uh, you know additional mentors, whether it's uh, using it in a flip class, whether it's an accelerated way based, you know there are multiple ways that we could use that uh, use the technology to really uh, to really help us. And lastly, I think we, whenever we have any new technology, there is a tendency to overestimate this, uh, what it can promise in the short term and underestimate its impact in the long term. So I think I look at the impact of these new technologies and impact of it in the long term because what I've seen, for instance, in our campus on different and very creative ways on how our faculty are using these technologies in the ways that we had not even imagined and uh, seeing you know, quite a bit of success. So, so that basically is how I see the use of technology as a way, as just another tool that could really enhance the, the learning experience for students and, uh, um, and at the same time recognizing its limitations would really help us uh, uh, use technology in a more effective way. Let's turn to the question of the physical campus. As, as you indicated earlier, you have spent some time in facilities management with a wide range of responsibilities for the, let's call it the bricks and mortar of the, of the place. And you now have the responsibility uh, uh, within your organization for a, for a large physical plant. Uh, these are topics that you're quite familiar with. As, as you look into the future for your institution now and for others, uh, how do you see the uh, importance or the need for a physical environment that we call a campus to continue to be? Well, I think the physical campus, the physical environment is still going to be very essential. Uh, I think there are uh, there are certain elements of, uh, of that experience, specifically when we talk about the traditional students, I don't think that could be emulated, at least today, in, uh, with all of the technologies uh, that we have. In a very facetious way, I say that if you put somebody in front of a computer uh, and expect them in four years that you get them a bachelor's degree, that's not going to be a bachelor's degree. They may know, they may learn something, but I think the experience of a student in college and uh, socializing and working in teams and working with uh, and uh, rubbing elbows with people of all uh, backgrounds and uh, ethnic groups and whatever. I think it's uh, tremendously important for them. Uh, however, we have to also look at, and on the other hand, that does not mean that a student should spend six years there and only 50% of them get a four uh, year college degree. So I think the technology could really help and reducing the amount of time that students need to be in the bricks and mortar. Uh, I think uh, uh, technologies could really help to increase the throughput of our bricks and mortar campuses. I think that's where the uh, nice balance of the bricks and clicks uh, really help us uh, create the, uh, the most optimal learning environment for the students, at the same time uh, provide the kind of uh, uh, the kind of human capital that uh, we need as a society. My students, when I ask them this question, uh, begin to talk about the importance of face-to-face -face communication, not just in the classroom, but, but outside, outside the classroom. 
Um, and it is, um, um, I think, I find them suggesting to me that that's the difference between real and synthetic or artificial, uh, that at some point that kind of person-to-person uh, -person, uh, communication, or in small groups, or as you suggest, the working together, the teamwork, is very difficult to accomplish except uh, in person. Uh, I think uh, you know technology is getting to a point that some of that can happen very seamlessly. I, I think part of it is that when you know some of that technology as part of its maturity cycle, it has not really gotten to a point. And when technology gets in the way of the of the experience, then it, you know technology becomes an impediment. It's not really there. But I think some of the technologies that we see today, whether it's in uh, telepresence and others, I think they are getting to be to provide a lot of that uh, immersive environment. Uh, ideally, it will, I would agree that if we could have the, uh, all of those sessions and all of those experiences to be face-to-face, -face, that would be wonderful. Uh, but given all of the limitations in terms of the you know, in cost and everything, and also where students are, where uh, in different uh, uh, places they are and uh, other responsibilities they have, as well as the role and responsibilities of the faculty and all of that. That, that kind of a face-to-face -face for all uh, parts of their experience become, uh, if not uh, uh, prohibitively expensive, it's uh, quite improbable for most students, except for maybe uh, uh, select uh, number of, uh, you know, of uh, institutions. So I think uh, when technology is used appropriately as well as face-to-face, -face, I think one can come up with that uh, healthy balance uh, to be able to experience both that intimacy that, uh, and that comfort uh, and the use technology in, in, uh, you know, in that way. And I think the experience could be very wonderful. Again, as I said, the technology has to be at a point where it will not really be felt. I mean, how many of, the, how many of us really look at our cars or our electricity as technology because it, uh, it is to the level of robustness and reliability that, you know, it's, it's a utility that we all use. And I think some of the technologies that we have in terms of uh, telepresence and, and others are beginning to, mm -hmm. to provide a good element of that one. So, so I think that's, that's basically the way that I would like to see it. Absolutely. If it, we can do it all face to face, wonderful. But I think the reality is that it's not really, going to be, uh, you know, possible for most students and, uh, you know, specifically when we bring the cost element into it. As we bring this to a close, um, I'd like to ask you to uh, think about advice to folks who are considering uh, campus planning in the future. Uh, if you were to imagine um, two or three things from your chair that you expect campus planners to have in mind as they deal with the future of uh, their particular campus? What, what might those be? I think well, you know, one of the elements uh, would really be that how uh, in terms of the data access and in terms of the kind of uh, data highway that we need to have on, camp uh, on our campuses, Connectivity is going to become quite important in a very ubiquitous way everywhere on the campus. So I think uh, that bandwidth and that capability will be first. Uh, second, uh, recognize that the kind of spaces that we need will be spaces that will be uh, fit more for active learning rather than the traditional classrooms uh, that we have had. And fourth, uh, recognize that whatever we built uh, with in the next two or three years, it could become obsolete. Uh, so how can we really build the kind of spaces that could really be easily modified as uh, the needs uh, of our uh, students, as well as the particular programs and uh, curriculum and pedagogy changes? So I think though, uh, so that flexibility is going to be uh, is going to be quite important. And then, as I said, connectivity. We're recognizing that in the future, for many of our classes, we may have students from all over the world. Uh, as well as faculty from all over the world. And uh, how can we bring all of those together? So that's why I think that 
the technology element becomes important. And then lastly, recognize that I think some of our campuses are going to become more like 24 uh, seven operations when we bring some of these elements together. Uh, so I think these are some of the, uh, you know, some of the basic elements that I see as we look at uh, the design of our uh, the classroom of the, of the future, basically. Well, thank you. We've been talking with uh, Mo Kwame, who is the president of San Jose State University. Thanks for spending the time with us today. Thank you very much, Mike.